I would now like to call upon Mr. Asim Chabra, a film journalist and critic. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to present a memento to the documentary filmmaker, Mr. Rishi Mehta, and Mr. Asim Chabra. Round of applause, please. Before I hand over the mic to Mr. Sim Tabra, I would like to remind you to kindly switch off your cell phone or turn them on silent and enjoy the masterclass. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Asim Chabra. Rishi and I uh, have traveled a long way to come here. He lives in Canada. I live in New York, actually. Um, actually, London. He lives in London. You actually moved to London? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, and he'll tell you why he lives in London also. We'll, yes. we'll talk to him about that. Um, you guys want to come in front? Yeah, you can come in front because this is going to be an interactive conversation. I mean, I'll talk to him, but. Uh, we we're also hoping that you guys will ask him questions. Um, I want to ask a question. Um, has anyone here seen Richie's new film, India in a Day? It's showing today. I know it's showing today, but it was released in theaters, in some theaters. And then, I don't know if anybody was in Mumbai at the Mami Film Festival. It was shown in Toronto. Um, so that's, I, I wish we, the session had been done later. Uh, so there are no chairs? Oh, Joseph here? Yeah. yeah I, I can't stand for two hours. Oh, one hour. <laughs> yeah. You guys don't mind if you sit, sit here, right? No. We don't have socks on, so it should be important. I yeah. So, um, I've known Richie for uh, quite a while. Um, in 2007, he made a film called Amar. Was it 2007? Yes. And before that, you made, made a short yes. uh, Amar, which was the same year, year before or something? Yeah, two years before. Yeah. 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 I have, I have a... Yeah. Um, it was a beautiful, lovely film with uh, Nasiruddin Shah and... Has anyone seen Amal? Yeah. And you guys should all see it because it is on Netflix here, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm sorry, my phone is talking to me. We asked you to turn off the phone. No, Siri is talking to me, man. Um, it's a lovely, beautiful film about... Uh, an auto driver in Delhi who inherits money and you know the search for the auto driver and um, uh, there's a wonderful actor who lived in Canada and also has moved to uh, London or yeah. the Nagra who plays the lead of the role of Amal but Nasir and uh, um, Roshan, Roshan and, and, and Seema Bishwas were all in it. Um, following that he made two other films. I've, I've, I've seen, uh, the, 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 have anyone seen his film called Siddharth? Alright, so one hand also. Siddharth is also on Netflix. No. Huh? No. Uh, no. Uh, Tanishta Chatterjee and uh, Rajesh Telling. Uh, Rajesh Kapoor is in a film called Siddharth? Which Rajat Kapoor? Uh, the, the actor, director? Yeah. Ask him. Yeah, I don't know. This is a Siddharth. I know Shashi Kapoor is in a film called Siddharth. That's right. Um, it was a lovely film that also, both, both his films premiered in Toronto. Uh, Siddharth is also available on Netflix. Uh, really beautifully made, heartbreaking, sad story, but sad stories are good also. Oh, we have chairs now. And my shoes are there. Yeah, this is better. Okay. Um, Let's start. And then, uh, yeah, we've already started. And then you mm -hmm. made this. Uh, a, a, a horror film which I haven't seen. No, no, science fiction. It's a big difference. Science fiction film. I should have come prepared. Uh, and it is called. I'll follow you down. I'll follow you down. And continuum in the United Kingdom. For some reason. And both that I'll follow you down and Siddharth will release the same time. That's right. Wow. How, how does somebody make two films in a day? Uh, that's a fascinating story. But we're here to talk about India in a day, um, which is. Uh, a project that uh, Google has been doing for a few years with other countries. So there is Italy in a day. Yes, Italy, Japan, Britain, Britain. and then like, and right, like the whole, the whole right, right. Um, 
And it's a very different kind of documentary filmmaking. Most documentary filmmakers go out on their own. That wasn't me. <laughs> Most documentary filmmakers go out on their own with their camera, in a group, alone, whatever, and they capture lives, whatever story they want to narrate. Um, Richie, tell us about what, how is this different? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, as Asim just said, first of all, thank you guys for coming, everyone. Um, and as Asim said, I, the first three films I made are actually fiction feature films. So I don't know what, I mean, I guess making a documentary film qualifies you as a documentary filmmaker. But this is my first documentary film as a director, uh, feature film. And I'll talk about some of my other work in docs before when I was a student. Um, but this particular project, I really had no intention of going into documentary filmmaking uh, specifically. It was a commission that came to me um, through Google and through uh, they, the other versions, Life in a Day, Britain in a Day, all these versions were done between Google, uh, YouTube at the time, but then Google acquired YouTube, um, and Scott Free Films out of London, which is really Scott's production house in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that production house is devoted to doing Ridley Scott's uh, kind of smaller independent films that he produces, rather than the big, you know, Aliens and Gladiator that he directs and produces out of Los Angeles. So they have two offices. And so they had, uh, YouTube had collaborated with these guys uh, quite a bit. Um, and then they wanted to, do, when Google acquired YouTube, they wanted to do India. They wanted to see, because now, uh, after six years of doing these projects, it, it, India was at a stage where they figured there's enough uh, internet access, there's enough smartphones, there's enough access to cameras at, uh, around the country now uh, that people could, in fact, um, shoot footage of their own lives on one specific day. First of all, here's a call out that we do through media, through online, on the Google page, uh, and then respond, respond on one day by giving footage. So that was the whole idea behind doing it now. And then um, they, somebody I know just recommended me, some, through the, the film industry in London, recommended me to Scott Free Films when they were looking for a South Asian director. Um, I, I suppose they wanted somebody who had a certain experience and a certain um, sensibility. Uh, so they saw Amal, my first film, and Siddharth, my second film. And then they called me and they said, would you do this? And I said, I didn't tell them I would have done it for free, but I really would have done it for free because it was a dream project to to direct a film where it's entirely put together in the editing based on footage we're given from Indians all over the country for me is a dream project. Because the projects I've been doing before those two other films and other projects as well are real exploration. They're attempts at exploration in India. Um, I'm a family from Punjab. I was born in Toronto. Uh, I've spent the last, you know, the last 15 years, about six months a year in India, mostly in Delhi. Um, and just trying to wrap my head around this place in all its complexity, which I'll talk about more. Uh, this to me was a, 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 an amazing um, opportunity to, to just watch what Indians were going to do. And not even Indians, anyone who was in the geographical boundaries of India. Um, and we were posing some questions um, on this film, which were optional to answer. You could answer, what are your views on life in evolving India? It's a very broad question. And so some people addressed that, some people didn't, and I wanted to know, I wanted to know what people were going to say and do. Um, so that, in a, a long answer to your question, that's, they just came to me. And, um, you know, what's, what's, what's really interesting is, um, you often hear, in fact, all filmmakers will admit that a film is eventually made on the editing table. Uh, you can shoot as much as you want to. It's the editor and uh, often the filmmaker, the editors themselves. They are the ones who actually put the film together and how the, how the narrative sort of like sort of flows through that editing process with mixing of sound and music and everything else eventually. But in this case, the film was actually made on the editing table because um, Richie and his team, how many submissions did you have? Oh, it was just over 16,000. Over 16,000. And this was... You you gave everybody one particular day, yeah. exactly a year ago, October 10th. October 10th. October 10th. Why was that day picked? Because it was, um, they wanted to finish the film around this time. They had to work backwards. Uh, so they wanted to do it in the fall, and they found it, they wanted to do it on Saturday, which is one of their stipulations, because some people are not working, so that there's a little, at least a little bit more relaxed. It's 
the food at the time. Uh, but it was also the, the only day in that month or that period where there was no major festival happening. I mean, there always is a festival happening somewhere in India, a major festival happening. It wasn't Ganbat, it wasn't something massive. Right. They wanted a normal, regular day. I kept trying to tell them it doesn't exist in India. But <laughs> maybe the 10th is the best we can do. Or 2015 at least. And it was. So it was in that zone. Yeah. But even though I didn't realize it was a Saturday, but um, and I've seen the film. Um, then many people are going to work. Many anyway. people yeah. are going to work. Kids are going to school. I guess kids do go to school on Saturdays. Yeah, I still haven't quite right figured out when people, because you ask any kid on any given day, uh, to Pia, Okay, um, well, why today and why not yesterday and why not? I don't really no, but in, in, in the U.S. and Canada, you know, yeah. we, we have the whole weekend off. Saturday, Sundays is no school. Yeah. Yeah. So you have kids going to school, you have uh, yeah. people going to the offices, you, you know. There are many, many narrative threads there. So, I, 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 you know, having, even have, having seen the film, I, I find it really fascinating that people across India, based on all the publicity and PR work that... Um, Richie and he got his support from many other filmmakers and Rock Kashyap. Mm. Uh, there was a video that, that you guys made, right? That's right. Yeah. Soy Akhtar. That's right. Um, Our Bhakti. Yeah. So we basically contacted a lot of these filmmakers to say we need help getting the word out. Right. We told them what it was about, and they all jumped. At the job. They recognized it was and, interesting. And yeah. so this video was made, and they asked people, and I think you also told me that. On the Google India page, people were also told. What? Well, yeah, if you just go on Google. For the 10 days prior, they would have, it said on the homepage. Right. It was a nice little, you have Google on your side, it's nice to get the word out. Right. So people shot this thing and you got about 16,000 entries. Mm-hmm. Um, how, what were the length of, on an average, or like how long was some and some, how short was? I can give you a, a, a clip could range from two seconds to three hours, an hour between. Um, we asked for unedited footage, so people gave us edited footage. So they would shoot the whole day, and then they would make their own versions of it, which would be then submitted as a two or three hour clip. And then if we, we would watch it and say, okay, if there's, we think there could be more interesting things, we would say, please give us the unedited footage. Most people gave us unedited footage. Some people, a couple of people gave us about 12 to 15 hours of footage. One person did a five camera setup on a 10 hour subject. Wow. So, yeah, we had five it? times ten Did you use any hours. of this? Oh, yeah, he, that's actually the biggest story in the film. Yeah, so, I'll, yeah. okay, let's just, we, we, we're jumping, let's, let's go with the process. 16,000 submissions come, and then you have a team of people, you know, yeah, watching. how many people sat and watched 16,000? So, we had a team of about 15, uh, we call them researchers, who were watching everything. That each person was assigned a chunk of footage. And by, by, mind you, the footage didn't come in on one day. Right. We started working on it on October 11th, um, but it took about three months to get everything. And some people didn't have the bandwidth to upload the footage. So Google would have to physically arrange to find the village, either get them a hard drive or go there with a hard drive, get the footage, and then bring it back and then ship it over to London when we were editing. Uh, so it took two or three months. By Christmas time, we had everything. But in that time, teams were watching the footage, and they would rate the footage. And any of the researchers would rate the footage, you know, one being the worst, five being the best, six being so bad, we, you have to see this. Um, <laughs> and we would uh, meet every week. I was watching stuff as well. We would meet every week and um, reevaluate our rating system. Because after a week of watching stuff, you realize, oh, wait a sec, this might be technically perfect, but there's nothing really behind it. Or this might be awful in terms of sound and picture quality, but what's being said or what's being shown is really kind of profound. So that's, this is, you know, it's not just aesthetics, it's this. So over the course of three or four months, we just kept, you know, revising out as we went. The editor, Beverly Mills, who really actually should be up here on stage, she's back in London, uh, and she's really quite a genius. And in fact, I was told this was actually a master class in documentary editing originally. It should be her here. Um, but, uh, so that was the process of getting it down. And then we, I was writing a script on it as we would watch things and as I would kind of interpret things, um, what, what I thought was very interesting. Um, and, and Beverly and I would have these long conversations for months about what we think this is about and what I think it's about and what she thinks it's and, and so we started discussing what the scenes could be, what the themes we believe are being shown to us. So you, you'd obviously seen Italy in a day and Japan in a day and there was UK, UK in a day yeah, Britain in a day. Britain in a day. Um, what ideas did you take from that? I mean, obviously you had completely new material, mm. so you can't 
imitate a style or you can't just, you know, just, you had to evolve into a different story, basically a different film. Yeah. But, but how were you inspired and influenced by that, those? That, that was, um, so the other In A Day films were, I would, they were very interesting films um, and very good films, but they're very, I would say they're themeless. There's no unifying theme or idea uniting them outside of the, look at our similarities and differences. These are just regular people shooting their lives. Um, and then we gauge the cultural differences from those minute aspects. Um, what was happening here was there was a central unifying theme emerging. Because of that question, I said, like, you know, if you like to, you talk about life in evolving India, and a lot of people have tried to address this issue. It's a very big issue. And what we found was happening was India seems to be the only country in the world where we've gone to Mars, the fourth country in the world to go to Mars. And as we all know, there are many pockets in this country that are living as they have for the last thousand years. Uh, there's no other place like this in the world where you can measure progress of humanity over the last thousand years of where we've been and we are, where we are actually going into the future in one country, one state. And people were reflecting on this in a very profound manner. So we found that there is actually a unifying theme about progress for humanity in this film. It's, there's one aspect which is about India, per se. But something much bigger is where we come from, where we're going. And the question surrounding, are we going in the right direction? Who are we leaving behind? What are the advantages and disadvantages of this? These are ideas that I could never address in a film. They're too big. Uh, but they were being presented to us. So we found that th this thread is spying so strong that there's going to be a strong theme in this film. So yeah, because, um, you know, one could quite easily, and in fact, before the project started, I thought it would be this big celebration of India, India shining, uh, which is what often is presented. Um, and there's some elements of truth in that also. I mean, there's so many truths in India. Um, but what I really, was very touched by the film was that you found really beautiful narratives of people's lives mm -hmm. and the struggles they have. And you know, the, there's a lot of joy and happiness also um, in, 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 in the way people in India live. But a lot of people in rural areas, in, in cities, um, their daily struggle for survival. Mm -hmm. um, and that was this footage that was delivered to you. It's not that you went seeking that. Mm -hmm. um, and you give a very uh, sort of a very vast, very big sweep. But it, it, not sweeping is the wrong word. But you know, there, there, there is a, there's a there's, there's real India that emerges out of the film, really. Um, and so, tell us more about the editing process itself and how because the film starts. I'm not giving it away, really, because it's it's a it's a total revelation when you watch the the. the but it starts with the, with the day, the morning, the sunrise, mm -hmm. you know, and then goes through the early, um, uh, you know, late morning and then yeah. afternoon and lunch and uh, towards the evening. Yeah. Um, tell us about how you sure. put it together. Yeah. I mean, as you said, how did we get what we got from the other film, Life in a Day, Britain in a Day, that was the structure. That they suggested a structure of we go from midnight to midnight chronologically so that you can you have something as an audience to hold on to with all this disparate, disparate footage. Um, and we realize that is the best way to go. So you, the script film starts at midnight and literally unfolds, you know, a few minutes into the film, the sun starts to rise. And then you start to see how people get up around the country, how people get ready for the day around the country, how some people go to work in the country, how they, what they do at work, and, and literally at the polls, at the, it's, the film is 87 minutes, 86 minutes long, at the exact halfway point is lunchtime in the film. You see how the country has lunch, all over the country, different types of foods, you know. Um, and then we go into the afternoon, and you know, there's the, there's, what we found was so fascinating, and, and now this is getting into nuts and bolts of, of I guess, documentary filming, but also fiction filming, any, any kind of filmmaking. Um, to generalize that. I think I'm going to try and generalize it as much as possible so that you know, we can talk about filmmaking. Um, in a narrative structure, um, especially when you're not sure what the tone of the film is going to be, we didn't know what the tone was going to be on this film. 
We didn't know if it was going to be a horror or a science fiction or a comedy or a drama. We were just going to get given footage and figure it out. I assumed it would be a comedy drama. Not to put any film into a box, but just in terms of you need to have some sort of tonality to connect the film. I think India is very dramatic and very funny. Um, I think our day-to-day -day lives can be that. And maybe that's how we are. I don't know. Um, and we found that the heavier dramatic stories were coming in, were shot in the afternoon, late afternoon. Ironically, they were given to us when the sun was at a certain point. So we realized this works perfectly for the film, where if the very beginning is very light and it's moving quickly, and you get the audience with the energy of the zest of her life here and the movement, and and there's there's stuff that really is quite disturbing. If you see every shot, but we're not focusing on the disturbing because it's there, just like it's there when you walk outside if you choose to see it or not. But we're talking about light, and we're trying not to judge any of it. And then when we get into the afternoon and we start to stop and stick to people's stories more and more, hopefully we've got the audience to that. Hopefully you, you invited the audience into the film and you built a trust that we're not going to waste your time, that we put so much effort into the craft of the, the filmmaking that you know, you know we're trying to do something with this. Once we built that trust, because there is a trust between the filmmaker and the audience, uh, I find most of the time that trust is broken very quickly when you feel contrivance in a film. Where you feel that this filmmaker, this team is trying to manipulate me uh, for profit. And so, if you can get past that stage, in the same way when you meet a person, I mean, I, my, the way I am as a person is when I meet somebody, I assume right away they are trustworthy and kind and are looking out for the best interests of other people until I have reason not to. Oftentimes, that reason comes very quickly and you just walk away. But then sometimes it doesn't, and a bond comes. So in this case, we saw these heavy, heavier stories. The story of the woman Priya, she'd given us. She sits on a, her terrace in Delhi. She's a single mother, and she is having a cigarette break, talking cigarette break in her pajamas, and she's just talking about the five minutes in a day she gets of to be herself, away from her son, and she loves her son, but she's alone in this world. She contemplates about the, the choices she hasn't made in her life. It's a very moving, very beautiful segment. And it was in the afternoon. And we said, OK, you know what? Let's, we have this movie going, and now it's time to stop and really spend time with some of these people. And then we go into the evening. The sun starts to set. You've spent time with a lot of these people. And now there's another energy. Because when night starts, and people are trying to go home, and the traffic goes crazy again, and you know, there's a, that buildup of energy, and then you have the end where we're trying to wrap this all up, bring it all together, revisit the characters hopefully you've gotten to know over the course of the film. Because people give us footage of themselves all day as we check in with some of them over the course. So the dramatic structure started to form itself. Uh, I'm not going to say a monkey could have done this, but when you look at everything, I, I, I think a lot of people have said, this makes sense. And let's, let's lay it out. Uh, so in that way, one is lucky to have been given footage of such such an honest and genuine nature, which I would also say is a characteristic of Indians, when you meet them, um, present from me included. You wear your heart on your sleeve. And that is a big difference between this film and, say, Japan and Japan, where it's not the same culturally that they said Japan. I'm not saying there's a difference between people, I think fundamentally people are the same everywhere, but when you meet them, there's a big difference. It's a very difficult to get an invitation to somebody's home in Japan. Very difficult. But once you do get an invitation to their home, you know you are in. Here, it takes about 10 seconds of talking to somebody in the right manner on the street. So, I mean, they the uh, I'm sorry for cutting you, but uh, while you're absolutely right, and uh, when you, especially when you're comparing India with some other countries like Japan, but what amazed me, what surprised me, and you know, was that here were completely random people who took their own video cameras or their iPhones or whatever, and they trusted you. They had no idea who you were. I mean, maybe somebody, some of them had seen your films. Mm -hmm. They trusted you where they 
in the mosque is one thing that there are stories about people having breakfast in the morning and you know kids getting ready for school etc those are lovely stories also but clear's a story and there were a few others yeah, yeah. rajesh because rajesh, yeah. rajesh is a friend of yours so rajesh tell him who's uh, who's an actor who was act uh, uh, played the lead in this film siddharth also has a very very beautiful very moving um, segment in the film i won't give away you guys should really watch it but i was really surprised that these people were just opening their heart out to the mm. camera and then they were just going to mail you or yeah. just 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 throw it out there and it's like bearing yourself totally to um, i was very uh, you know people in india don't go to therapists that often no. you know you know um and i was it was amazing uh <laughs> just as a side note uh, a couple things yeah rajesh again he's a very dear friend of mine but um he had told me something special was happening it was his birthday on the 10th of october and something special was happening that day with his family he told me about it and i said can you please yeah. shoot something for this and give it to us so he did and i didn't shoot it because i didn't want to be by i was 16 dollars submission not shooting my friends uh so i left that for the rest of the team and i said look that i i'm biased i think this is very special but i'll give it to you to i and this is part of the trust thing if people are going to give their footage uh i wasn't going to try and take advantage of that um but i had an experience a small experience all day in one of my short films i did which was i think 2002 there was a uh, i was making shorts all the time experimenting here and there which again is something very important for any filmmaker to keep doing it uh and there was some special festival in japan which i had heard about um for like one minute film it's called one minute film festival they have a lot of these now they have one this is 2002 i got excited and i went to shot film with my friend on the streets it was a really clever i thought it was a really clever idea and i was in school at the time i finished the film it was actually a one shot film so i had to edit it i literally shot it i went back i just put some titles on it output it and we were using tapes at the time right you do digital and you have to tape so i had it on tape and i had it on the computer the film and i went and made a copy I, the deadline was that day i mailed that day so i went and made a copy of the tape and then i mailed i went straight to the post office like mailed it couriered it to the festival and i went back to the school i said okay time to back up the film i went back to the computer computer crashed hard drive crashed footage was lost i said oh man okay but i still have the tape and the one tape gone i went to make a copy of the tape and the machine destroyed the tape So the only version of the film now was on its way to Japan. Nothing else existed. I said, "Shit, what do I do?" And so I messaged the, the festival saying, "I just mailed you the only copy of the film I just made. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Can you please send it back to me when you get it?" Whether you accept it or not, whether you accept it or not, I just need it back now. I never heard from it ever again. The festival didn't exist. It was some fraudulent. I, the film is gone. I still don't know where it is. It's somewhere maybe in Japan. Somebody has it. Well, there's a film that you made that's gone. That doesn't somewhere. exist. So that was when I first realized there's a story to be told. You're here. mailing your the, the only copy of your footage and I'm sure a lot of people made copies but some of them didn't actually. When they when they sent it to us they couldn't themselves keep they didn't have the space the digital space to keep the footage. Because sometimes it was on their phones. They would just send it to us and erase it. But we had the masters for most of these people. And granted I say 70% of the footage was people just shooting traffic. Yeah, they would just drive around and put their camera out the window and shoot and it's like hey well somebody's got to watch this for 6 hours and maybe even in those 2 seconds they caught something interesting but then stuff like three hours you know just a smaller story some people just went and talked to the camera they did something very special it was a real trust trust is a huge thing for me between a filmmaker and audience between the subject and the filmmaker especially in documentary filmmaking um trust is a huge thing because and it's the same thing look i mean Well, obviously you can hear from my voice you know I'm born and raised in Canada when I come here to do films um I, a lot of the stuff I do is on the streets in the, the two features I made in Delhi a big part of it in the Kutub Minar area uh which is a neighborhood that we just happen to have an affinity for it works for the film that were films that were made in both films on most of our and so it's very important for me that when we're shooting in those areas and we're building an authenticity into the film that the neighborhood and the people don't feel like we're taking advantage of them. So it took a long time for me to build that trust with them and for them to understand why are you here? Why did you come from Canada here to show our to show us? What are you trying to show about us? And they're completely justified in this. 
And so when we build that trust, and I sit down with all of them, every household, the people kind of who are kind of the, the respected elders of the area, th th these are old neighborhoods. Explain, this is the movie, this is what we're trying to do, this is why I'm trying to do it. And once they hear the why, they say, don't go about it, I don't, no problem. Um, and for me, one of the big things coming in to India, because I have the ability to leave India, is that I will never exploit India. That's, it's so easy. It's easy for any of you here to exploit India, for dramatic gains, for personal gains. And that could be even just through gaze. You don't even have to exploit anybody specifically. You just set up the camera and show it in a certain context, and that could be an exploitation. And I'm very sensitive to that. And I'm also sensitive to the other side, which is melodrama. So with this, it was very, I think that's, again, another reason maybe why they said, why did you do this film? Because they'd seen my other work. And I'm very sensitive to that. So the trust for me, I, I don't think anyone who submitted had seen my work. I think they probably trusted Anurag. Uh, Raka Show was one of the uh, executive producers of the film, yeah. Yeah, and they probably trusted the name of Ridley Scott to be attached. Yeah. And, like, and so, in that way, and by the way, Ridley and Anurag and Zoya, and Eric, they were very respectful of us just doing our thing. We made the film and we would send them edits at certain stages and they would give notes once in a while, but they were very, the whole team was very respectful. Just do the film, you think, what, do what you think this footage is trying to do, which is what we tried to do. Um, so they were very respectful in that process. A lot of people in the footage even addressed Anurag. Some people say Anurag G, you know, I hope you see this. Like it, a lot of people were specifically speaking to him, which is very interesting. Um, which is great. Yeah. But one other point is nobody in what you what we in this room would classify as the economically wealthy class in this country submitted any footage for the film. Not a single clip came in from that strategy. Uh, which also said something very interesting. Again, if you're trying to respond, if you're trying to make a documentary especially, if you're trying to make any film, you want it to mean something, you want it to be unique, you want it to have an individual voice. I always say that that if filmmaking is so, so challenging, so difficult, and so inconvenient as a career and a vocation, that if you're going to do it, I can actually compare it to a room like this, where you say, any film you're going to make, whatever the theme or topic or idea behind it, is that theme or topic or idea has been addressed in some manner at some point in the history of cinema, at some point. So if you're going to say something, let's say in this lecture hall, we have a theme or an idea, the talk, and everyone gets to speak once, and you're somewhere in the middle, and then your turn comes, are you going to repeat what the person in the front row said half an hour earlier, or are you going to add to this discussion in a unique manner with your own voice. And I always look at it, if I'm gonna make a film, it's got to be that, otherwise there's no point. And this film came, it offered that opportunity. When we, I saw that, my God, nobody from that world has submitted. Does that mean they have nothing to say? Does that mean they're okay with the status quo? Does that mean that they're not paying attention? Does that mean they're closed as a society? I don't know, but it's something to capitalize on. That means that the people who did submit have something to say, and that's another trust. They have given us something. We are going to do the absolute best we can. And in order to do that, we have to work 24 hours a day as a team until they pull the plug to make sure we saw everything, to make sure we vetted everything, to make sure we gave everyone a chance, to make sure we did the best we could with this. So that's how that ties in. I have to um, say, I mean, I'm very fond of this guy. I mean, we are friends also, but I'm very fond of him as a, as a filmmaker. The two films of his that I have really, really been very deeply moved by, both Amal and Zidhat, both deal with not just working class. I mean, in Zidhat, they're like really, really poor and... and yeah, they were. Yeah. But the, the kind of, what, what Richie said earlier, that you know he, he wants to respect India, the, the, the caring with which he writes about these characters, the compassion that he gives to them, it is just absolutely, I mean, there are not too many filmmakers who really do that. And, the, you know, he grew up in Toronto. Um, but moving forward, when you make a documentary like this, I mean, even with the footage that he was given, it was almost like they, they may not have seen your work, but many of the people sort of knew uh -huh. how you would be able to make this, these stories come alive. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, and I mean, it's not all sad. India, a lot of Indian days, a lot of fun. It's, there's humor in it, there's, 
the thing that we all of you and I, you know, and I, I've lived in India, you know, I was born here. You, you connect to families, parents, kids eating food, breakfast, you know, going to work. Um, crying. Yeah, crying, yeah. But there's a lot of truth in it also. And that I think is something remarkable that you just lucked out as such that the people gave you the stuff that, really? yeah, it, it's, really? sort of, it's almost in the same, you know, the narrative thread that you have of your work, uh, earlier work also, this sort of clearly follows it very well. It really does. That's yeah. why I looked at the footage and I said, this is, this is the uh, end of an era in my filmmaking career. <laughs> because it, it is, it's the end of an argument, it's the end of an explore, in a way it really is. And also something else, and this is very, very pertinent to everyone in this room, if you're interested in documentary filmmaking or any filmmaking again, is to me, I mean, I sit back and I watch in the end of the day now as a viewer because I didn't shoot the footage. So now that we've edited it and put it together and put the score on it and the music, and, and by the way, we didn't manipulate the footage at all. There's a very little color correction. Um, we didn't speed up or slow down the footage. There's a lot of footage in the film which is sped up or, and slowed down, but we didn't do that. That was given to us. That was how it was shot, high, high frame rate, low frame rate. All we did was edit and music and sound, some sound design just to fix things. Um, but the level of um, sophistication in the footage. There are clips, for example, if you when you see the film. Oh, and by the way, I, I, this is really something. So we're showing the film tonight at seven thirty here, uh, and tomorrow the film will release in India on YouTube free. Forever. I like it, and I'm sure you will like it. Please tell all your friends and family to watch it. They can watch it on YouTube tomorrow. Yeah. But watch the big screen today. That's a special experience. Yeah, I mean, it would be very special, but at the same time, that the point of it was it was shot for free, given to us for free. It was going to be given, it's given, it's available for free. So tomorrow on YouTube, forever, it will be there. So just type in India in a day at some point. Tomorrow and watch it again. Or next week. Um, but the level of sophistication, so there's a clip, for example, which I'm just going to give it away. Um, <laughs> when the director gives it away, then you can't blame him. You know, you can't blame anybody. Yeah. Um, where there's a little girl from Tamil Nadu. She's sitting on a bed. She's four years old. Very cute. She has these two little toys in her hand. Sukriti is her name. And her father is shooting. It is shooting this footage of her on the bed. And he is dictating to her what to say. He is saying, my name is, and she says, my name is, this is Sukriti, Sukriti, and she, he just, she just repeats exactly what he says, and she's having a fun, a laugh with this. She doesn't know what she's saying, she's just having fun. And he goes on to say, you know, I am four years old, I am four years old, um, and I'd like to tell you something very, very important. Um, so listen carefully. And then she comes closer to the camera, and she says, when I become 18 years old, I'd like to learn Karate. And she's, again, not knowing what she's saying. She's having fun with this. Because when I grow older, I have a problem with this public. And so I have to defend myself. And that's it. That was the only clip this guy gave. And it was so cute, and it's so devastating, and it's so tragic, and it's so beautiful. I mean, look at this. And we say, you know, if I was to go and make a documentary on the state of women's rights in this country, I'm not sure I could have done it more eloquently than this father just did it with this kid in 75 seconds. I'm not sure I could have. It's, it, it said so much, what he given us. And it was sloppy, the technical aspect of it, but it couldn't, couldn't be better, it couldn't be more perfect. So I looked at this, this is just an example of many other things in the film. I said, if this is happening, on the streets, just a father picking up a camera, no filming experience, and doing this. That means people have become so sophisticated and so media savvy of what they're receiving, how they're watching and consuming material, and what they're able to do themselves, and addressing issues in a manner that if I had a million dollars and a crew of 200 people in two years, I may not be able to do as well as this person just did. Um, that means to me the level of independent filmmaking has to, to evolve now. It's time to change. It's time to get better. Because if somebody prefers to watch a two-minute cat video than to watch the comedy that I put in the cinema, 
is what people do now. That means we have to do it better. We have to really reach into ourselves. We have to be creative. We have to be sophisticated. We have to take it to the move. It has to evolve into something. There has to be a reason why we did it and they didn't just do it on the streets. That has completely changed how I look at films. And I think when you watch it today or tomorrow or whenever, I, I hope you identify what I'm talking about. Because again, I didn't shoot this. I'm people all over the country shot it with no experience. So um, this is supposed to be a master class with interaction with the audience. So I want you guys to, how many of you are filmmakers? I, I can, all right. And how many of you have attempted or made documentaries or want to make documentaries? So, Wait, oh my God. How many of you like movies? <laughs> Look, how many of you want to make documentaries? Look at that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's your chance to talk to this guy who had not made a documentary until this one came this way. But I will say, so I said earlier, uh, when I was in film school in Canada, um, most of my training was in documentary film editing. Okay. It was in documentary film editing. So I was writing scripts and learning how to direct on set fiction. And my goal in editing, I was, my goal was to become a writer, director of fiction. But the most, most of the work and most of the studying I did was actually documentary film editing. And the, I would say it uses the same part of your brain as writing a, a fiction fe feature is editing a documentary. It is the exact same part of your brain is being tickled. Um, and I'd forgotten that until this showed up, until Indian Day showed up. I said, okay, we are going to write the film based on the footage we are given, which basically means you are given a certain lexicon with which to write something. In this case, it was footage of varying um, frame rates and styles and um, formats. Uh, no different from you were given 26 letters in English language in which to write a script uh, and express certain ideas, or you know, if, if you're writing English. Um, so, so, so I would say that, that if you are interested in even getting into fiction filmmaking, I would say studying documentary is very, very important. If you're interested in getting into documentary filmmaking, and you can figure that out, you have the basis for writing fiction features. Okay, questions for Rishi Mehta. Yeah. Do, do no. we have someone um, who can walk around with a mic? If not, we can just. I'm pretty loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah but you're also sitting right here, but if somebody in the back. Oh, we can repeat. I won't be able to yeah. hear. Yeah. Okay, fine. So you touched a little bit upon the selection process uh, uh, for these clips. So could you talk a little more, more about the editing process? <laughs> Like how the first cut got assembled, yeah, yeah. how long it was, and how you guys trimmed it down. Sure. The question is about the editing process of the film. Um, so it was uh, it was very elaborate. So again, Beverly, the editor, was instrumental because she's the editor. Um, so we would have these discussions, and you want to respect. Again, I, I, I may be you know speaking to a more advanced audience, and I'm not sure but the level of filmmaking. Um, is in the audience, but you want to respect the editor's creative choices as well. I, I would like to. Because I think it's only to the benefit of a project when you are able to um, inspire your creative team to be as creative as possible, and then you can curate that. If they go too far or they have not, you can calibrate that for the director. So to me, it was this is writing the whole thing, it was like a 50 page document I had written. <coughs> what I think the major stories are, where they could go, and then she was also forming it in her head because she had to actually physically execute this with the footage. And then, again, several months into it, um, we had a very intense discussion where she said there's no way she can do this in the time allotted um, to put a, get a film out of this. And I completely agree, it was ridiculous because the film was, the footage was so special, we said, my God, in order to do the best we could do with it, um, we need much more time. So she disappeared for six weeks, went back to her home. And I would, I emailed her the script, and she says, I'm just going to start sending you scenes. I'm just going to sit quietly and really interpret what you've said and written and what we've all talked about and what we see in the footage, and I'm just going to start spitting scenes back to you. And every few days, I would get, she would mail me a scene. And I would say 90. 5% of what the final film is is what she was doing. So that's the magic of having an amazing editor 
and a very clear path of communication, which by the way, all filmmaking is essentially communication, is, is um, when you have uh, some sort of inspiration to, for an idea, and you can figure out how to, to set that idea in motion, and then if you can clearly communicate with the people around you, um, which by the way is how relationships form anyways, and how they also break down, mostly. Um, so our, our path to communication was very clear. And so she would send me sequences which were so beautiful. Sometimes she would take major risks and say, you know what, I just tried something. And sometimes it would really work. Sometimes it wasn't necessarily appropriate to what the bigger picture was. Halfway through the film, once she had formed maybe 40, 45 minutes of the film, um, at that point the film started taking on its own life, where we didn't have to make the decisions as much as we had to just listen to what the film was telling us. It was starting to shape itself. Uh, some of you might say, this guy's crazy, what are you talking about, things don't speak to you in that way. Uh, they do when you don't sleep at night, on it. Um, and so, the, the again, it's, 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 it's a very complicated structure of a film. The sequences are very complex. There is so much footage. I mean, some clips we used for like half a second. And she would just try things. She was free to experiment. And that's the key. And she's also very talented. Um, and then I would, you know, we would come back with notes and just go back and forth. And it was the first time, to be honest, all my other films, every other film I co-edited myself with an editor, where I would take scenes, they would take scenes, I would form it, they would form it, we would exchange, work on each other's scenes, back and forth. This was not that. Um, so it was trust with her and extensive labor from her and extensive labor from me. There was nothing unturned. Even when we finished editing the film, I had a list of things that may have been left behind. Little clips, they said, what about this clip? What about this? We could maybe still form a scene out of this. We edited scenes after the film was done and proved by everybody just to make sure we didn't miss something, to recheck things. We just, short answer is labor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, all the way back, go to yeah. that, that guy, he has a mic there, yeah. I'm not a guy. Sorry. Yeah, no, I started to realize that's all gosh, it's all over. Question for you. Like, I'm also a documentary filmmaker. I just want to put forward, like, one of the experience I had during my shoot. Like, uh, one of the subjects uh, I was, like, documentary is all about the uncertain reality. Because <clears throat> you cannot always, you know, project your camera with a script or everything, but you have to just keep everything rolling whatever comes into it. So one of the subject was using lots of slangs and abuses. It was like uh, invading someone's privacy, and which I have put that clip in my documentary. So what do you think about the ethical part of the filmmaker on this regard? Like to how, to how much extent we can go, you know, to make the documentary yeah. really Exciting, yeah. realistic, as yeah. well as also keep little <coughs> to be little ethical also. Yeah. So, what do you think about that balance? That's a very good question, actually, and we face that on this film <laughs> as well. Um, where analogous to your example, we were given footage of a family in Assam uh, on the streets. They literally live in a shack and they work on the streets. The children are beggars at a local temple. Um, the parents they sell beauties across the street and when they uh we were watching some of this footage and we said okay fine it's a family kind of going on their day just like any other family in a different world uh, a different strata i guess and then they showed the kids getting ready for school and the kids were bathing in the gutter and i've never seen this before i've never seen children actually in the side of the street in that gutter on the down where they were washing their face and the mother was getting them ready. And then she was tying the daughter's hair back and putting on the school uniforms on the street, making sure they were proper. And then they got onto their motorcycle with their father and went to school. And with as much dignity as you can imagine. And we saw this footage and we said, oh my god, I've never seen anything like this. And most Indians we show have never seen anything like this. And so I was questioning, how did the family what is happening here with the filmmaker who shot this and the family? We've never, we haven't seen the filmmaker. This is completely about this family because somebody's shooting it. And they were there in the morning when they got up in their tiny shack 
And so we watched the whole day as it unfolded, and then at the, in the evening they go back home, and it's raining like hell, and they're just riding the motorcycle. Somebody's on a motorcycle following them in the rain, and then they go home, and then at home it happens, where the wife and the husband get into an argument because the husband wants to smoke hash. And the wife says, fuck off and die, asshole. I'm sick of you doing this to me. And they get into an argument. And it's all in Assamese, obviously. So we have, we have to get a lot of British translators. I speak Hindi and Punjabi. I don't understand most of the. And this was videotaped. This was all taped yeah. as if they didn't even know these filmmakers were there. And they must, I mean, this was, this, the space was like this. They must have been all crammed there. I said, what is happening? How did this family allow these filmmakers in? I don't think they recognize what this contract was between them, this unspoken contract. And then we contacted the filmmakers and said, look, you have this really interesting family you shot all day with no judgment on what they're doing. It's very beautiful, it's very, it's, it's, there's a lot of things happening here. But what happened at the end? Did they know? And then, and then finally she, and he's saying, get me, get me the hash, just get me the hash, let me just get it, get it for me. And then she says, fine, smoke and die, asshole. I don't care. And then she gets it to him and he takes a drag and he's like, uh, and it's really something. And then, He's kind of in his own zone. He says, okay, cook, cook for me, cook. I mean, everything bad is in those 30 seconds. Everything. And he said, my God, how did they allow you to do this? And I, so we called the filmmakers. He said, did they? No. And they said, yeah, they knew. They knew we were there. And they said, this is just our life. They didn't know what people might think. They didn't really care what people would think. Her situation, I don't think she was, you know, she, this is her everyday life. And so we had a huge debate. It was the biggest debate, and I'm telling you this because we're in this master class right now. It was a very, very big debate for us whether we include it or not. We ended up not including it. And the reason is because it didn't add to the tapestry of what we were creating at that point. As I said, beyond halfway point, the film was starting to say something. And it wasn't that it was painting a color of a, a rosy India nor was it painting the color of the people on the street. This is just one example. There's other, uh, many other things happening in the film. Uh, but we felt that what, what would actually bend, what would have helped the film if we put this in? Even though it's honest, even though it's genuine, and even though it probably needs to be seen in a certain manner, but we also know these things happen. We said, you know what, what point is it? is it? There are other things I need to show about this family, which are quite shocking, but not that. That was the worst. And so it became the, we would have this debate, the smoke and die asshole. We kept going back, should we include the smoke and die asshole? <laughs> and it became the argument, emails, you know what, I like this, the smoke and die asshole, I don't know. It became the whole thing. Um, so my answer to you, the long answer, is does including that add to the tapestry of what you're trying to do overall? Why did you start this project? What do you believe it could be? What is it, what is it, what is it evolving into? Does this add to that? Because it's, quite shocking, because it shows somebody in a not so pleasant light, if it's important for what you're trying to achieve. And you really, I, I had to ask myself this question for a long time. What am I now trying to achieve with this film? What are we as a team trying to achieve? We're not trying to create something jingoistic. We're trying to move you and we're trying to make you see what this country is about. We're trying to make you see what people are about. But this didn't specifically add to that texture. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. If, if you had made a film which is a narrative about this one particular family itself, yeah. then would you have used the footage? Because this is a very telling point about how this yes. family functions. Of course. I absolutely would. I mean, obviously it depends on what the theme of that film is. And tone is another thing, right? You have to respect tone. This is, to be honest, I, when I grew up watching mainstream Hindi cinema, I loved it. I still love it. One thing I still find perplexing sometimes in some of the mainstream stuff is the tone talk, where you see a film, and the first half of the film is a romantic comedy, and then the second half is a bloodbath. And I say, how did this happen? How did we go from one to another? And I find it quite shocking. And audiences here, I think, are calibrated a little bit different, because it's like you, you are getting everything in a film, every kind of drama. Uh, but for me, the trust that you build up in the beginning of a film is it also a total trust. So if you're going to go into that territory, at least at least brace us for the territory you're going into. Some of my most my favorite films are very tough films, but they don't come out of nowhere if this happens. 
Um, and if you're going to documentary, it's real, right? So if you're going to get into that that space, which is a little bit of exploitation, doing it, you were doing it, and or is there a point? And and, and this is the example. I mean, Siddharth was based. Uh, it's, it's, the story of Siddharth is a street laborer searching for his missing son, um, who he sends away to a factory in Punjab to work at age 12. He never sees him, <coughs> and he starts searching for him. And all of the issues he faces in his search are not things that apply to people like you and like us. He doesn't know how to spell his son's name. He doesn't know what the internet is. He, he never took a photograph of his son. He doesn't even know how to file a police report. And so for me to do a story about that is exploitation of a certain kind. The only thing is, is based on two stories, the rickshaw I met, who was telling me this happened to him, and he was asking me for help on how to find his son. And I said, you know, but you guy, and he told me, and I said, could you spell that? He said, me. Okay, do you have a photograph? No. He never took a photograph. I never occurred to me to take a photograph. So what have you been doing? I, I can't take time off work. I have to support my family now. So I just ask people who get into my rickshaw. I tried to help the guy, and I couldn't. The son was the son was long gone. It had been a year. I said, "Well, you know what? One thing I can do is what I happen to do. At least make a. I mean, I'll make a film, but but in making a film, it does no service to this person to just show his plight on its own. Just to show that this guy has nothing. That's not going to help anyone. That's information. I could just get a newspaper story on that." What will really help will to be to show his plight, to tug at the heartstrings, at how tough this is, and at the same time to show the dignity with which he's tackling it. That he doesn't have time for mourning. He doesn't have the emotional space for it, nor does he have the funds, the, the money for it. And when you see the dignity with which he is combating it, that he's got to go to work the next day. Whereas I certainly would have taken 10 years off and cried every day. And you say, my God, the resilience, what we're capable of, the resilience we're capable of as people, that's something also we can learn from. So the, there's two sides to that, where it's like, I'm not going to exploit this person. I'm going to try and glean something out of it at the same time and illuminate. In a long answer, it's a very, very um, touchy subject of exploitation, especially in documentaries. So you have to really figure out what you want this to be about. Excuse me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, there and then this gentleman here and then here. I'm sorry, I'm just. Hello. Uh, I'm a similar director. I was asked by uh, a director to shoot a Hindi movie. Actually, this is a Hindi movie, but the first seven minutes of the film should be uh, shot as a documentary style, that, that is, uh, I should be shooting the people in the streets, how they live, how they eat, uh, how they go around the places like that. But he said me that I shouldn't be, I, I shouldn't inform that I am shooting them, and I should be shooting in, uh, shoot them, uh, you know, uh, like in stealth mode, okay? something like that. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit guilty not telling them, and uh, this is the first thing I need to ask. Is, is it uh, right to shoot them without informing them? Uh, one. The second one is. Sorry for that. This is the first thing. Yeah. I can answer the first. Yeah. <laughs> second thing I forgot. I will. Yeah. So, so I would say that if you're if you're asked to shoot people or you're going to shoot people in stealth mode on the streets, I've done it in all of my films. To be honest. Um, because they're shot on the street and you can't possibly get permissions from you know, 3,000 people at a railway station, uh, much less a railway station, by the way. Um, but in that circumstance, um, there are two ways to proceed. One is to, put up, this is a real legal thing. I don't know how it actually works here. It works in, kind of in Canada and the US. You literally just put up a sign. Say, if you walk past this sign, and you have two signs in a certain zone, you you may be photographed for a film. And then people, whether they choose to read it or not, that's actually, that covers you legally. Morally and ethically, I would say because I believed in what I was doing, in the film that I was, the films that I was making, I trusted my own ethics on the reasons I was making them, that if somebody 
happen to see this film one day on TV and say, what the hell, that's me at the railway station, they wouldn't be ashamed to be in the film. In fact, even they may be proud. And that's, that's how I justify these things. And that, that's, how, that's how I justify working every day, all day on the film as well, by the way. Um, that's how, you know, that's how you're getting up in the morning. So if, if you have that, I would, I would say proceed. Uh, if you question the movie, and if the movie is being made purely for commerce reasons, then I would say it's not fair. That, that you could recreate that. Okay, we have time for just a couple of more questions. I suddenly realized it's 12.26, where does the time go? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, you had your hand up, yeah. And Richie's going to be here the whole day. He'll keep answering all your questions. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> you couldn't do a Q&A after the screening also, yeah, I think, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Hi, sir. I met you outside. Just yes. Uh, I'd like to, my name is Aditya Mehta, by the way. Hi. I'd like to ask you, this is regarding India in the day. Seeing the life presented in India, how has it changed you as a person? And how has it changed you wow. uh, as a way do you see things? <laughs> How has it changed your view of filming as a, as a filmmaker, as a whole, and as a person, being, uh, being engrossed in this life presented by millions of people who share their unique view of life, of their own life? Can I ask you a question? I had asked you a few months ago when I interviewed you. Yeah. How did it change your perspective of India? Or what did it make you learn about India? Okay. So, one of, so it has changed me as a filmmaker, I had mentioned, I think, before, of the level of filmmaking has to increase from everybody, especially for me, this is very much inside me, because of what the sophistication we were seeing. So as a filmmaker, that has very much inspired me. And some of the footage is so spectacularly well done as well. I'm actually even thinking of outsourcing my B-roll for the next film, feature film I do. And they're saying, listen, I need shots of the mountains. Anyone want to go get them and give them to me and let people, because it's really better than what I could have done. Um, and my view of India, I, I thought after two films and you know four or five years here over the last 10, I was starting to figure things out. I think this film has, beyond a doubt, illustrated to me that I will never figure this country out. Is it is completely incomprehensible. It's too big, it's too vast, it's too diverse, too complex. Uh, I really don't know how it's governed. Um, I think it's amazing. I think no matter what happens, even if Trump goes crazy one day, this, this country will endure. Um, I mean, they will stand. That's yeah, the most no, remarkable it, thing. It yeah. really, it really will. Uh, and most profoundly, from the India standpoint, you know, we receive footage from the Northeast, we receive footage from the interiors, from the coasts, from fishermen, fishing villages, um, all over the place, right? From the Himalayas and south. And the differences are cosmetic between people which I really, really uh, am trying to internalize. You have to, it takes time for you to really understand that fundamentally we all want the same. What we all want as people are very simple needs. Yeah. So we have time for one. This lady had a question, and then we'll, uh, I think we need to wrap up. And my sense is, I don't know where the organizers are. But yeah. Uh, I live in Toronto, where Richie is a, a star, uh, certainly in the uh, film world, um, both for the quality of his work and uh, the brilliance of his smile and soul. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the film uh, today because I haven't seen it yet. I kind of wish the uh, workshop would have happened yeah, we, uh, after. But I find it fascinating that you're discussing Sujharta in the context of documentary filmmaking, um, because I know it's inspired by so many true stories. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, you know, they were actors mm -hmm. um, playing the role. So, so it's uh, 
very interesting to hear. Um, I spoke to your daddy before I came. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question was, why is this film a UK Indian uh, co-production and not a Canadian in some way? Ah, technical question on the actual nature of the production. It is a UK Indian production because uh, it was a Google India initiative uh, produced by Scott Free UK. So Ridley's company, Ridley Scott's company based out of the UK, so entirely um, kind of executed and administered in the United Kingdom um, and initiated here. So I was just walking down the street in London at the right, right place at the right time. No. Did I say something about the brilliance of a soul and a smile? Yeah. <laughs> um, I know of what I speak. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of the film uh, that uh, caused quite an uproar back home. There was a film, uh, a documentary produced out of footage all, that was all posted online, the people that shot in the up north. Mm. Uh, yeah. and indigenous so, territory. And it was, uh, so it's happening all over the place. Yes, except that film turned out to be very controversial. The footage that was chosen by the filmmaker, um, everybody who had footage in it went and asked to have their footage removed. Oh. And so the film, that's, the film that exists today is 75 minutes of silence. You know, this is a really interesting point. Um, we had one person, so when the first trailer of the film was released, which was not really a trailer in fact, and this is very important, this goes back to the point that um, the young lady made earlier about exploitation and trust. And there was, um, the first trailer of this film was actually not really a trailer, it was like a short documentary, a five minute long online, which was used at a technology conference that Google had um, organized, where they wanted to show some of the technological aspects of India. This is part of the original conception of the film. And we do the film, we have to do this piece. And somebody had, well, once, once that piece was put online, people obviously started responding. So all my footage is in, you know, I contributed, my footage is in. And one person came up, uh, mailed us and said, um, I'm not comfortable with the use of my footage in this context. Because that's not what I thought you guys would do. And, and, it, and it, was, it was totally amicable, but then I spoke to him and I said, look, that's one thing which has been done and is being done, and it's showing a certain side of India, uh, but that's not the film. So trust, trust in what we're doing, that the agenda behind this film is a pure representation of what you gave us. Trust in that. And he said, okay. If that is happening, then proceed. You may use it. And we ended up using his footage. And it's quite, it's a this Punjabi guy who goes into the slums and finds one of his ex students mm -hmm. has given up study. Mm -hmm. It's a very important story, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, we had that one case where it was like, oh, there needs to be that trust between the subject and the filmmaking team. And by the way, you also brought up Siddharth. This is a really important point. Um, Siddharth to me is actually a mix of fiction and documentary filmmaking. It really is a, an integrated style of filmmaking, which I also think is going to happen more and more now, like shooting on the streets, um, where we had our actors in really crazy locations doing their scenes, and we were not photographing them with telephoto lenses across the street, hiding in a car. We were with them, like this gentleman is here. We were in their faces, and we were shooting, and people were walking by, sometimes in front of the camera, sometimes behind, the actors were doing their things. And the whole thing was, I wanted the, uh, the viewer to feel, to question, are these actors? After a while, you say, wait a second, I really am not sure that there's such an intimacy with this, but they're everywhere. And it's very real. Um, and with that, we had a very extensive, we had about 100 visual effects shots in the film. Um, of, removing people's eyeballs, putting sunglasses on people's eyeballs. Because people look by, walk by and look at the camera. The shot was perfect, the, the take was perfect, the performance was perfect. Just that one guy looked in. So we would cut that guy's head off, put somebody else's head on him. <laughs> we did all these tricks and a lot of effort to, um, to, cre to create that vibe, that this is what you're seeing. Because it really was a mix of it. And that's, 
also more and more and more where I'm heading. Because audiences can gauge very quickly the truth when they're seeing it. Um, in the same way, when you watch a fiction film, I think the films that we don't like are the films where we gauge, and like I said, the contrivance, always the, the performance is not truthful. This guy just showed up, didn't really care, walked away. The script is not truthful. You, you very quickly you can get, you can, your brain can gauge it faster than you think you can. When you're watching um, crowdsourced stuff, when you're watching stuff online that people have just posted, we just assume it's true. Th that assumption is there. All of that pre-trust section is gone. It is truth. It may be bullshit, it may not be interesting, but it's truth. And therefore, that can be utilized in, in a new way, which is what now, after doing this film, again, to answer that question, what I'm trying to do. Utilize that, that trust and that idea of truth in imagery. Great, on that note, uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming and hope all of you, most of you will go see this film on the big screen today uh, or watch it on YouTube tomorrow. So thank you.